and the Canadian Society for Brain and Behavior and Cognitive Neuroscience. So congratulations, Daniela, for all this. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the afternoon session. I'm excited to chair, and I'm happy that Randy invited me back a second year. So with that, I'm really excited to um, pass things over to Dr. Um, Prabjot Dami, who is currently a CIHR-funded postdoc at SFU. Um, Dr. Dami has done important work in depression, particularly in youth depression, um, and is now focusing his work on neurophysiology and clinical responses to antidepressants. So, um, Dr. Dami, I turn it over to you for a 15-minute talk. Um, so today I'll be talking about basically the resilience, so the topic of resilience in the context of depression, both when it, in the context of the onset, but also the treatment. And the ideas part, which I'm very excited to talk about, will come a bit later, but I won't spoil it just yet. So I'm hoping to start off with a brief overview of this important topic. So many of us face some form of stress nearly every day of our lives. And how we respond to stress will vary from person to person. Uh, for example, we can go through similar experiences, but we'll respond quite differently. And resilience itself can be defined quite broadly, depending on what literature you look into. Uh, but this common de definition by the APA, or the American Psychological Association, defines resilience as a process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or significant sources of stress. So in the context of depression, or more clinically known as major depressive disorder, it's a prevalent debilitating mental health related illness. And the most commonly associated symptoms include depressed mood and loss of interest. And when we talk about the context of resilience and how it applies to depression research, there's really two themes that come up when you look at the literature. One is looking at how resilience influences the actual onset of a first episode. Hello? Yep, great. Sure. So I'll first be talking about how resilience can be studied before the actual first episode of depression occurs. And that's arguably the most common way of looking into the field of resilience and depression. And there's lots of different ways to look at depression from a biological level. I'll be talking more about it from the neural circuitry perspective. So, and when we look at depression and resilience, there's different study designs that can be employed. One is looking retrospectively at, for example, healthy controls with a low risk of depression, healthy controls who commonly are defined as, you know, having a first degree family member with depression, and then patients with an ongoing and current episode of depression. And for example, there's many studies on this field. Uh, here, I just took an example study. And here, what they show was that patients with depression had lower prefrontal cortex activity during a cognitive task. Interestingly enough, Uneffective uh, relatives did not differ from health controls. So this is one way of looking at depression and resilience from a very cross-sectional perspective. Then there's other studies which will take a more perspective approach to it. Basically what they would do is they recruit patients or not patients, but health controls who have risk, different levels of risk for depression. And they'll keep track and measure different neurobiological measures over time. And here we see with longitudinal studies in patients who have, or people with risk of depression, uh, for example, in this study was based off their mothers having depression at that time. Uh, what studies have shown is that whether a person eventually displays an episode of depression or not, depending on the resilience, there's different functional connectivity uh, patterns that can be seen way before. For example, in this study, they took measurements at uh, about 10 to 12 years old, and about seven years on average is when they looked ahead of time. And they found that, for example, the limbic network connectivity or the executive control network connectivity, there was quite a few differences in, within these networks between healthy controls, people who were considered at risk of develop, developing depression who did not develop depression, and then people who eventually did develop depression. 
And another way to look at resilience in the context of depression is a more novel approach, which looks at people who are, you know, uh, relatively healthy at one point, they go through a lesion, for example, a stroke, and then they develop depression symptoms. And here we see, once again, from a network perspective, different areas seem to be implicated in both risk, but also the likelihood of resilience when it comes to the depression scores following that lesion. And for example, in this study, which was just published, they showed, for example, the canonical networks of the ventral attention or the salience network, which you see to the right in the red, that was associated with risk. So higher risk of developing depression uh, symptoms. Whereas those people who showed lesions in these blue patches that you see to the right, they're more likely to show resilience or lesser or less or less uh, depression symptoms as measured by self-reported clinical scales. So the big picture, just to summarize everything so far, is that resilience to depression is characterized by both the activity and functional connectivity in regions and networks, primarily involved in cognitive control, emotional regulation, and reward processing. And here you see some of the more canonical networks as they're defined in the literature, but basically those three networks are the ones that are commonly shown to be implicated when it comes to resilience and depression. So now looking to the other side of the coin, what if a person develops depression, they show remission, what are the factors that are associated with resilience to preventing another episode occurring down the line? And here, once again, we see different measures, once again, looking from a neuroimaging perspective. Uh, for example, 40 to 60% of patients with a first-time depression episode will at some point have another episode later on. And just to be clear, remission is considered as someone showing a uh, clinical score after going through an episode below a certain threshold, depending on the clinical scale. And then what we see here with these studies is, once again, it's taking a longitudinal approach. What they do is they scan patients who are both in remission as well as health controls. Then they look years down the line. I think in this study it was about 12 to 16 months down the road. And they look at, were there any neural signatures at that first point that can indicate whether someone was going to develop a remission in regards to depression or uh, have a recurrence happen at that point? And what they showed was that remitted patients who later had a recurrence of depression should decrease prefrontal cortex activity when engaged in the cognitive control task. For example, here, it was an NBACA task, I believe. And then other studies have shown the same pattern, this time in functional connectivity metrics. Uh, the big picture here, once again, is that if we look at people who have showed or achieved remission, there are patterns still there which can tell whether someone is likely or not likely to develop in another episode months, if not years down the line. So, so far we've spoken about the neural circuitry associated with both the potential onset of depression, but also the likelihood of recurrence happening sometime in the future. But what about ways to prevent or therapeutic interventions to enhance resilience in either context? And here there's a wide range of treatments or interventions that can be looked at from psychological or psychotherapy to medications to also more recently brain stimulation, which I will be focused on now. And the interesting part with brain stimulation is I hope I kind of painted the idea that certain networks or regions are more so implicated when it comes to resilience and depression. And the interesting thing with brain stimulation, it, it can be very targeted in regards to what we want to stimulate, whether it's a region or a specific network of interest. So for example, uh, at eBrain Lab here at Simon Fraser University, we commonly use something referred to as transcranial magnetic stimulation, which you see on that left. It's that black coil in the right hand of Dr. Frazan being applied to a uh, student in the lab. And when we use TMS, we can use it in two ways primarily, to either just probe the neurophysiology of the brain that's usually involving just applying a pulse every five or so seconds. But if we apply TMS in a repetitive fashion, it can actually lead to long lasting changes in neurophysiology, cognition and behavior, and also clinical symptoms associated with mental health related illnesses, uh, arguably the most common context being to treat depression. So when we look at the use of RTMS to causally, causally assess influence of the prefrontal cortex on stress response, there's a few studies that do suggest stimulating the prefrontal cortex is involved in how a person responds to certain stressful situations. Uh, so these are just, once again, two exemplar studies. Uh, both involved healthy controls. They would do a task, some of them related to stress or in the uh, inducing of stress. Then they would do the TMS or the RTMS in this case, and then they would measure the stress response again. So to the left, you see heart rate variability, and to the right, you see uh, cortisol. And basically what they show with this literature is that when you stimulate with RTMS, it does either enhance the resilience to the stressful situation or it makes a person more susceptible. But once again, this is very short term. Uh, you're looking at studies that are long about an hour in length. 
So the question then becomes is how can RTMS be used to actually enhance resilience in the context of treating depression or preventing a re reoccurrence uh, down the road. And once again, to emphasize that people with depression, about 40 to 60 patients have had, who have their first episode will have another episode sometime down later uh, on, either in the months or years following the first episode. And when we look at the likelihood of reoccurrence, there's really two networks that pop up in the literature. And those are the networks related to cognitive control and reward processing. So the question I want to ask today was, can or how brain simulation be used to promote resilience, specifically in the context of preventing recurrence following that first episode of depression? And to really kind of merge this with the current literature on depression, I did want to mention the idea of biotypes, which Dr. Foster mentioned earlier today. And the brief idea behind biotypes in the context of depression is that people will have varying neurobiology features, each linked with certain phenotypes, if you will. And we're in the context of neural networks or functional connectivity patterns, these are kind of six commonly reported biotypes in the field. You have the default mode network, the salience network, the threat response network, reward processing, attention, and cognitive control. So merging the idea of biotypes with TMS, we see with TMS, for example, where we target, we can target specific symptoms. So this was a recent study that looked at retrospectively people who underwent RTMS for the treatment of depression. And what they showed was that depending on where they just happened to target, different symptoms improved. And what you see here is with the red or the yellow color, dysphoric targets or something like mood, low mood or anhedonia, they improved much more relative to the axion up. So something like somatic, like sleep disorders or something along uh, anxiety in the inverse. So the four to one meant the mood or anhedonia improved much larger compared to the anxiety uh, somatic symptoms and vice versa for the bluish purple color. So what we know is that there are biotypes that might be implicated in both depression itself, but also the reoccurrence of depression following a first episode. And we also know that TMS can be used to localize and target specific networks related to specific symptoms. So the big picture I had for this talk was that can we target specific networks based on the individual to promote resilience following remission. So once again, to emphasize that the most commonly implicated networks in regards to recurrence of depression are the cognitive control and reward networks that we see here. And this is kind of a concept that's being borrowed from the depression literature in general, but it hasn't been really used in the context of preventing reoccurrence down the line. So the big idea here was we have, for example, two people, they've successfully undergone treatment for depression. They're both now in remission. Can we take some sort of neural signature of these people to detect which of these networks they might have deficits in following remission to then prevent a reoccurrence or decrease the likelihood of recurrence happening down the line? And once again, just to emphasize that resilience is thought to influence both the potential onset of depression and the future occurrences following episode. And I do hope to paint the idea here anyways, uh, that brain simulation can just be one potential tool to promote resilience, uh, depending on what networks we believe are implicated in the reoccurrence of depression and what we can target as well. And I hope I am within time. That sums up my ideas talk. Thank you, right on time. Um, I'm gonna open it up to questions. I'm gonna follow in Randy's lead and ask a question first. <laughs> Um, I thought the concept of biotypes was really interesting. I'm just curious um, how stable those biotypes are in individuals. Um, have folk, folks focused on kind of test retest reliability in networks um, in individuals with MDD? Is there you know, evidence that those networks look similar from one testing session to another? So that's a very good and very important question. Um, to be sure, no, there are the concerns that are these reliable. For example, we know with functional connectivity, if it's a five minute scan versus an hour scan, those can look quite different. And how those implicate whether a person belongs to, for example, cluster A or cluster B are valid concerns that have been brought up through different papers. And we're going to have studies done that, not necessarily just yet. And the other question is the stability of clustering itself as a, for example, machine learning technique. Uh, studies have shown, for example, people can cluster into groups, another group from across the world will then do the exact same analysis and they report the clusters look way different than they were expecting. So I think right now it's in a place where the idea has a lot of potential and it's about the accumulating evidence kind of backing it up at this point. Thank you. I'm going to pass it over to Randy. Thanks. Very interesting talk. 
Um, I have a question along the same lines, but actually I'm going to change my question now. Um, it's more to do with what do you think is actually happening uh, with, with stimulation? Like, why does it work? Uh, so that's a question I was prepared for. And the short answer is we don't know, I think. Uh, the parameter space for brain stimulation is extremely vast. And at times it can be daunting and other times very exciting to know that there are things we can manipulate. Uh, for example, if we look at the most common paradigms for stimulation and depression, we consider one to be excitatory. So we're upregulating the activity of a certain region and the other one's inhibitory. And we're down kind of regulating it. Uh, but if we look at the variability, for example, of we bring in 50 people, uh, some will show the opposite effect in regards to what we're expecting. So if it's high frequency RTMS, they'll show some sort of inhibitory effect. Uh, so that's the primer space is just so vast at this point that the field is trying to gather enough information. Uh, I can go on and on a long list about what's leading to, you know, what effects are occurring and because of why. Uh, it's all ideas at this point, and I feel like the evidence just, it's not there yet to make a strong statement as to why we think a certain stimulation paradigm is. Uh, well, in regards to brain stimulation, a part of it will depend on the region itself. So once again, for example, if we stimulate the prefrontal cortex with an excitatory, we bring that excitatory to the occipital cortex, it might even have an inhibitory effect. So, and then we also have to consider when we stimulate a region, we're not stimulating that region alone. Uh, more recent, the last five to last 10 years, uh, functional connectivity, an idea that if we stimulate region A, maybe we're not really changing just that region, but the, the effects are more downstream. Uh, so there's just so many ways to potentially explain the effects. Uh, I, I think it's a bit of both. For example, some of our work that Dr. Fazan will be going into later, uh, it also depends on how you're measuring it. If it's fMRI versus EEG, the effects might be local in one versus something that suggests maybe the effects are a bit farther down, downstream. Um, so yeah, it's really hard to say at this point. Like I said, it's a very daunting in regards to how many parameters there are. Uh, but I think it's also very exciting, the fact that the more we learn, the more controlled stimulation we'll get to at some point. This is a question from Susan Fitzpatrick on Zoom. How do you control for differences in task engagement during functional MR studies? Individuals with MD might simply not be engaged in the task or motivated to perform resulting in the observed patterns. Right, so a lot of the biotyping work, at least in the context of fMRI, is done with resting state. Um, but of course, with resting state, you don't know the level of spontaneous thought, like was mentioned before. Uh, it can vary individual to in, you know, person to person. Um, in regards to task fMRI for people with depression, for example, uh, some of the tasks will be modulated depending on difficulty. So if a person is performing too well, there will be some sort of modulation built into the task to then kind of make it a bit more difficult. Um, but that, of course, depends on the task. If it's something simpler, for example, the go-no-go, -go, uh, my response would be it's not just, it's not considered during the online task portion. Uh, and that's kind of looked at in retrospective were certain patients performing more poorly or better and how that relates to, example, the biotypes or whether treatment responses of interest. Um, so yeah. Thank you, that was very interesting. I'm curious about the default network rather than the executive control network. Um, so a lot of the deficits in tasks could potentially be due to the fact that people are just busy doing other things in their mind when you're depressed. So that, that will be the case in the ruminating case, right? Um, it will be different from anhedonia, but I'm wondering um, in the case for rumination, kind of heavy depression, have you thought about um, targeting specifically the default network core, uh, which should be easy to get to with TMS in order to um, disconnect it in some way? So I don't know if you will be inhibitory on how you would target it, but the idea would be to uh, reduce the functional connectivity within the default network core, which we know is heightened in rumination, and which we know something like psychedelics uh, reduce, and they're also helpful for depression sometimes. So I wonder if that could be um, an intervention, and if you thought about that, and if that would be feasible to, uh, to attempt. Right, so great question. So in regards to TMS, I should emphasize that it is can only apply to the superficial layer, so whatever is near the scalp. So we wouldn't be targeting uh, deep structural uh, parts directly anyways, but parts of the default mode network are accessible with TMS. And 
there is a paper who kind of took the idea, ran with it from Connor Liston and others in 2014, where they basically targeted default mode network components or regions in the context of depression. And then they only looked at it from a resting state perspective, but they did show that the modulation of that connectivity just within that network uh, did correlate with eventual rumination scores following a treatment course with RTMS. Um, so once again, on paper, it sounds very feasible. And that paper did show that it had clinical effects uh, in the positive direction. Um, I think a concern would be with the default mode network in the context of depression, uh, some papers do suggest the other way where uh, the group from China, for example, I think it was over a thousand participants in that study. And they showed the idea that the default mode network is actually from a connectivity perspective decreased in uh, people with depression relative to health controls. And if you looked at the literature before that study, it was typically the other way around with participants in North America primarily, where the default mode network was considered to be heightened. So I think also it comes from two directions. Can TMS be used to modulate the default mode network in the context of rumination? But also understanding which way do we want to modulate it? Do we want to increase the connectivity depending on one paper, or do we want to decrease the connectivity depending on another paper? Um, just a follow up about that. Hi, my name's Jackie. I'm from UBC. Um, a question about like how you might find different effects based on the study. Uh, TMS isn't very uh, like region specific, right? So it's not like you're not can't target a specific area that like accurately. Could that be one of the reasons why in one study you might find um, modulation in one direction and then another in the other direction? So TMS itself, you're looking at just a few centimeters with the diameter. So I would say it is quite focal when we're dealing with the brain. Um, whether we're simulating the patterns of stimulation, what we're exactly we're stimulating, those are all factors. But in regards to actually modulating a default mode network, there's only been that one study and a few follow-ups. Uh, so my, I think my concern is more about with the rusting state papers, what they suggest, do we want to modulate in one direction versus the other when it comes to the default mode network and rumination? Uh, but if TMS was to be used to target these networks, uh, I would argue the focality is definitely there, especially if it's a superficial area. Um, but once again, considering the downstream effects, uh, that's a whole other story and things we need to consider when using TMS, both as a basic neuroscience tool, but also in the clinic. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I misunderstood there. No. Other questions? Can you run through the process for the biotyping, the biotype different networks? Sure. Um, so a lot of it does deal with machine learning techniques. So uh, for example, from a most prominent paper in the field, at least with MRI data, would be Drysdale from 2017. And the idea is you collect some sort of data for, once again, resting state fMRI, for example. Uh, you construct the network in this context, and you basically apply a unsupervised method. So basically, we have a bunch of data. We don't know what cluster, for example, a patient belongs to, we want the algorithm to determine all of that part. Um, so for in that paper, they use, for example, um, hierarchical trees, I believe, or hierarchical clustering, I should say. Um, so basically, they look for features that are similar in one group, but also separate them from a distinct group. And there they found four biotypes, for example. And they related two of those biotypes to more anhedonia-related symptoms, and the other was more to somatic symptoms. Um, but once again, depending on the actual algorithm used, that's going to heavily influence the clusters you find and just how relevant they are to different um, symptoms associated with it. Randy again, do you know, so within that biotype is, are they distinct patterns? So for example, if you were to, let's say, um, put in a healthy control population, would they be sort of smeared in a separate cluster or would they be sort of distributed across the other biotypes or some, mishmash in the middle. That's a great, so that particular paper, it was just people with depression. And that's where they found the distinction between the different biotypes. Um, in other papers, there's definitely a mismatch where uh, it becomes a much more muddled picture when you include healthy controls, because then you'll have one biotype where it's, hey, this person, you know, maybe, or this group is more related to anhedonia, but from a biological perspective, they're quite similar to healthy controls. So there's definitely still a lot of work to be done in regards to 
using the data to separate groups, but then also making sure that that's relevant to the clinical features we're interested in. Because um, even our work, sometimes you know, I'll look at data and you have the two groups and you expect this clear distinction, which the biological data does show, but then when you try relating it to symptoms in the next step, then it just, it doesn't add up sometimes. I mean, I guess I'm kind of seeing whether it relates some, in some ways to like Kalina's um, uh, space for it, for having these different uh, term you used for it, basically. The state space. State space, yeah. And whether there's sort of a bias where someone sort of lies and the the biotypes is actually sort of a continuum of that where they, someone goes to an extreme on one particular biotype, but other people may have a proclivity to be that biotype and not necessarily show clinical signs per se. And if you can think about it that way or if there'd be a way to even see if, that, if that's true or not. Right, no, that's, and I, I don't know if it exactly directs it or addresses it, but I know certain papers too, Proposed the idea that maybe we, instead of looking at a cluster and distinct, you know, group one versus group two, it might be better to look at groups along some sort of clinical score and more from a continuous data perspective to say, you know, it's not group one versus group two, but how does this feature correlates, for example, with this anhedonia, for example, or a depressed mood. Um, I know there was a recent paper which their main point was they took a large sample group and they looked at biotypes. They also looked at just cross sectional comparisons between healthy controls and people with depression. And basically the effects were minimal to say the least, uh, just from an effect size perspective. So the big idea behind that paper was we need to understand the neurobiology behind different symptoms instead of just making this dichotomous distinction between healthy controls and people with depression or biotype one, two, et cetera. Um, and that's where I do think there's a lot of promise in regards to studying these individual symptoms than just healthy controls versus people with depression. Got a question from Zoom, but, uh, from Robert. Does any one group seem to benefit more from the type of individualized targeted sim stimulation? Yeah, so that's a great point. Um, in that seminal paper, what they did find was the they initially found four biotypes, and then they took it a step further and they did RTMS to the medial prefrontal cortex. And the big picture behind there was that certain groups, I think it was two of the four clusters, actually responded quite well. And to the other clusters then responded quite poorly to the treatment. So the big idea wasn't there was in that study wasn't just that we can biotype people, but these biotypes then can influence eventual treatment decisions. For example, if we can determine person A or person one is you know, classified as belonging to cluster A, RTMS might be good for them, where in another person, maybe some sort of pharmacological or psychotherapy treatment might be better for them. So in regards to psychiatry and depression research within the framework of biotyping, is not only figuring out how people are during the illness, but then how can we tailor treatments depending on that biotype they belong to. Um, I have another question. So I'm just curious about comorbidities with MDD and how um, comorbidities might fare into um, this work on biotypes and uh, responsiveness to different kinds of treatments. How does that factor into some of your work? Yeah, so admittedly with the data we have, there is quite a bit, uh, particularly from the anxiety side of things. Um, it does factor in from the perspective of if we're looking to tailor a treatment to an individual. Um, for example, if I can go back to this study, uh, for example, here you see, depending on where you target, you're either vastly improving the uh, mood or anhedonia compared to anxiety, or vice versa, you were very much improving anxiety, but not so much the mood component. Um, so other studies have begun to maybe consider the idea of maybe having two treatment targets, have a person go with two weeks of one site that's more related to the mood part, and then the other two weeks do another target that's more related to the anxiety part. So once again, these are very prelim preliminary works that are being conducted. But at some point, I think there is going to be the consideration that you never have a person just with depression, most likely. Anxiety is highly comorbid with it and then tailoring treatment to address both of those, at least within the brain stimulation RTMS uh, framework. I have another question. This is Daniela. I'm breaking my own rule. Daniela Palumbo here asking another question. Um, so um, I'm just like looking at the names of these biotypes, and I'm just curious, in addition to kind of mapping these on to different individuals um, and, you know, taking that tailorized approach, do you see changes or um, correlates of different kinds of cognitive abilities in folks who fall into these biotypes? Like is somebody who shows a more 
threat network biotype is that somebody who's going to perform differently on cognitive tasks that assess threat. So there's a correspondence between the biotype at the biological level and at the cognitive level. And does that change with treatment? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, a lot of the research is kind of, let's just do a baseline functional resting state fMRI and then kind of essentially ignore everything you just mentioned, unfortunately. Um, so there's not much work that I know of that has looked into that. Um, and I, it should be done because just like you mentioned, especially when we're doing brain simulation, for example, we're targeting the DLPFC, which is the most common target for RTMS and depression. Um, the DLPFC is classically associated with so many things higher order. And the fact is we don't know how those more, you know, for example, the cognitive components are varying with it. It's always looked at from a clinical scale perspective. So I think there's so much room to be done into looking how these treatments or even biotypes they feed into different cognitive domains. Um, Cause right now it's just very much resting state data, whether it's EEG or fMRI and just kind of overlaying it on what we know from older health control studies and making inferences based on that. But in regards to the same samples that are collected, there's not much uh, being done on that front yet. All right, we have another question from Zoom from Bryce Phillips. Given the relatively high prevalence of treatment-resistant depression in patients with MD, do you know if there are differences in the efficacy of RTMS for people with treatment-resistant depression? Yeah, so in regards to RTMS, uh, there is accumulating evidence, and the response rate, depending on the paper and the protocol, varies, but it's typically 30 to 40 percent. So you have a person who has failed typically two to three first-line treatments, uh, medication and or psychotherapy, uh, then they will undergo RTMS. And the response rate there is about 30 to 40%. Um, but I should mention that response rate is classified as a person showing a reduction of 50% or greater on their clinical scores. So it's not that their clinical scores improved only by 30 to 40%. It's 30 to 40% patients show 50% reduction or greater. Um, just want to clarify that since sometimes people think it's the other way around. So there is a good number of people who do show that status of being a responder, classically considered in the clinic, um, but you still have around 50 to 60% who will not meet that criteria. Thank you so much. Really interesting talk. This is Molly Caracross from SFU. Um, just sort of going off that question, are there any, has there been any work looking at sort of individual characteristics that might make people more likely to respond to a treatment like this? So a lot of that is being done from the targeting perspective. So in regards to that question, I would say the most common one being right now is individualized functional connectivity. So in the context of depression, for example, in RTMS, a lot of the work has been done. We want to target the subgenual uh, cingulate cortex. Uh, so in regards to tailorizing that to the individual, uh, we'll, for example, plant a connectivity seed in that region, and we want to look at where it maximally correlates near the DLPFC. Um, and there are studies showing that when you tailor that target exactly to where that maximal connectivity is, uh, it actually correlates with the amount they improve following the treatment. So it's a very hot topic in regards to using functional connectivity to kind of tailor uh, RTMS anyways. And there is promise, at least in the context of the SGACC and targeting that to uh, treat depression. I'm still going back in my mind to this idea of primary versus secondary um, effects of depression on brain circuitry, because it's a high bar. So what you're trying to do is very difficult prevent recurrence, given the massive incidence of recurrence, given that medications, you know, are not very effective at preventing recurrence. CBT is a little more effective, but that's not very effective either. Mindfulness, you can add, makes it a little bit more effective, but that's still not as effective as ideal. So it's a high bar so, uh, of what you're trying to do. And I'm thinking, when we're targeting brain regions, is there some way to understand these different biotypes which match so well in different networks that we know of and to try to understand which ones are there that might be causative versus uh, cons like the consequence of the cause, right? So if I have heightened threat, 
Um, of course, I'm going to have impaired cognitive control, but um, increasing my cognitive control is not going to help me. It's not going to prevent me from relapsing because the original cause still remains. So there is some way to take the approach. By the way, I'm surprised at the second bullet point here, which uh, seems that it's not the networks that would be most, that I would have expected to be most uh, sensitive to relapse that actually are. Uh, but nonetheless, I just want to ask if, if you're thinking about doing some kind of a um, multi-tier analysis or causative analysis to try to target regions that are uh, closer to the originating cause of the symptomatology rather than ones that could be secondary? Right, no, that's a great and very important question. Um, some of our work, I think that ties back into the idea of understanding individualized symptoms. So instead of just saying depression and leaving it there, um, trying to understand how one feature might correlate, for example, with anhedonia versus um, one being more implicated in the cognitive control component. I think it's definitely you know still pie in the sky at this moment, but I think that's where there can be work to not only understand and delineate these neural underpinnings of these individual features, and that's where then the targeting can come in after we have that knowledge as to we have a good idea that this one is implicated in this cognitive task or emotional regulation, and then also understanding how to target it, but also what to do with the targeting. Because um, once again, there's other papers out there that show when you apply target, for example, excitatory RTMS to you know one region, and then you apply it to a different region, it's going to have opposite effects. One, it does what we think it's going to do, which is excitatory, and the other is going to be inhibitory. Um, so I think all that still needs to be done. It's definitely very much in the preliminary. Uh, you know, our studies have done that. I would either say it's last two to three years um, that are just being published. So ideally, we would have the exact link between what we want to target and what we think we're doing with that region or network in this context. Uh, but right now, it's, it's very much an idea. Um, <laughs> I'll leave it at that. It just occurred to me while I was listening to what you were saying that, uh, in fact, some of the most consistent findings that point to uh, networks like the control network could be due to the fact that it is the most consistent thing across all different uh, depressive uh, subtypes. Whereas if you get to, if you, if you're doing, if, if you take the approach that you're suggesting, which is taking the, the subtypes, you might be able to reveal things that are not showing up in the group analysis, combining all depression that are in the, the control network, but are at different networks that might be better uh, targets for intervention. You know what I mean? <laughs> So you're kind of like flipping it if I'm getting it right, or? Yeah, so it's possible that the cognitive control network is coming up here as a predictor, not because it's the most effective predictor, but because it's the most common across all the heterogeneous uh, right. okay. kinds of depression. Right. Whereas if you have a good way of separating the different people with depression into subtypes, you might see that there's stronger predictors that are stronger for each individual subgroup. Whereas the cognitive control, even though it's the only thing that shows up at the big massive right. group, is actually not as strong as individual predictors, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that goes back to the you know, analytics and the heterogeneity of dealing with depression or people with depression. Um, there's definitely, you know, for example, cognitive control might pop out when we do a cross-sectional between two groups, how the control is in depression, but it might not be the most implicated from a treatment perspective. So yeah, I definitely agree with that. Mm -hmm. So it looks like we have time for one more question. I would love to get a trainee question to round us off if anybody has any burning questions, either on Zoom or in person. There. They don't need to be burning. They can be half-baked. Any question is a great question. This has been a very stimulating discussion. Also, it doesn't have to be a trainee. Oh, great. It's okay. Um, just going back to one of the questions about uh, specific sites and different, um, I guess, that targeting different symptoms or people with different um, symptom biotypes or symptom types, uh, would that necessarily matter um, I guess if you have non-specific effects for like the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, like the for the example, the um, study you said that did the site um, 
in the default mode network that had that showed a response to for rumination. Um, when that hasn't that been showed, I guess, has that been showed for other sites um, regardless? Like, is that something that you, is that something that you think is like a problem or a benefit of RTMS? Um, I would say it's, it's a benefit in the context where I think with RTMS, the more we learn about it, yes, it's daunting the parameter space, but once we can start figuring the things out, it gives us that much power to control how we stimulate and what we want to target. Um, the DLPFC itself was, I believe, brought up from the late 80s with PET imaging in the context of depression. Um, so that's where that kind of became the foundation to stimulate it with RTMS in the 90s. Uh, so I feel like there is quite a bit of potential. It's just the idea that we need to understand a bit more what to stimulate for what symptoms and how to stimulate it once again. Um, so it's hard to say exactly, but I feel like it's more potential at this point that it should be looked at. So do you find um, that regardless of the site that you target, that you'll find a varied response and you'll find responses to certain symptoms um, across the board? No, okay, so no. So there are studies that will do first DLPFC. They'll have people who respond and those who don't. And then they'll do a different target on those non-responders. And then for your various you know, hypothetical reasons, those people then respond. So it does seem that it's, it seems to be the case that where you do the simulation, uh, it does affect whether a person responds or not. And there are other studies that have shown, for example, if I stimulate the DLPFC, that's one type of response, but people who show more anhedonia at that time, they'll move the targeting to more of the uh, medial prefrontal cortex, a region heavily implicated in reward processing. All of a sudden that becomes quite effective for treatment of depression in that particular individual. So by all means, where you stimulate, uh, from all the evidence we have is quite important in regards to whether a person will respond or not. And once again, it ties back into what symptoms you really want to improve in that individual. Um, just an example, once again, when they targeted people with the medial prefrontal cortex, there were people who showed worse anhedonia, but they were also then responsive to that treatment when they weren't responsive to the DLPFC treatment. low frequency, you could do high frequency, and that would, um, like, you still see the same amount of response overall in a study. Right. So I think that ties more into RTMS as a tool. And the idea that, for example, if you do excitatory, most, if I did 50 people, most will show the excitatory effect. Uh, just a small portion might not show an effect or might show the opposite effect that we're expecting. Um, but these are all there's so many reasons as to why that may occur. I think it's more important to frame it. If it does the excitatory effect that we anticipate, will it then lead to the effects that we're hoping for? So I, I don't think it's much the idea. It's just how do we tailor RTMS as a neurotechnological tool to make sure it's doing exactly what we want to do every time we're applying it to a person. I think that's more where I would come from at it. 